pouring on, on Elijah. And uh, so Elijah runs, and I want to go to chapter 19, actually. Elijah runs, and uh, he, he just cut part of this short. Uh, he gets into, the, into this cave, and God begins speaking to him. And tells him, I want you to go and you anoint this king and this king and do this and this. And um, uh, then uh, also um, uh, anoint verse 16. You shall anoint Jehu, the son of Nimshi, as king over Israel. And Elisha, the son of Saphat, of Abel Mehola, you shall anoint as prophet in your place. Then jump down to verse 19. So he departed from there and found Elisha, the son of Saphat, who was plowing with 12 yoke of oxen before him. And he was with the twelve. I want you to just notice this phrase, that Elijah passed by him, threw his mantle on him. Okay? He just passed by him. It's like Jesus on, on the walking in the water, you know. The disciples are there, and they're all afraid and everything, and, and uh, they see what they think is a ghost, and it's Jesus walking, and, it, and it's like he was going to walk right on by him, Right? Well, that's kind of what Elisha is do Elijah is doing here. He's just going to walk right on by Elisha. But as he does, he just takes his mantle off and throws it on him and keeps right on walking. And uh, you know the story. In fact, the next verse says he, he leaves the oxen and so on. And he, he goes and he sacrifices and he leaves his father and mother. And he goes to become the servant of Elijah. Okay? So here he is. He's the servant now. He, he was... Let's put this in a little bit of perspective. He's plowing with a 12th yoke of oxen. That means his dad wasn't poor. That's right. That's very right. Okay. They've got a pretty big spread. And he's out there. He's with the 12th yoke. That means there's 11 more in front of him. And he's plowing along. And Elijah comes and throws his mantle on him. And what Elisha is really doing is he recognizes something here. There's something in that action that speaks to Elisha to where he recognizes that God is doing something and Elijah is doing something uh, by the Spirit. And he, Elisha, is willing to lay down to forsake his home, forsake his family, except you leave father, mother, brother, sister for my sake, forsake the wealth, that was his, all right? Uh, I mean, we don't know if he was the oldest or not, but according to Scripture, we only know he's the only one. So we'd have to say it was probably his, okay? And he lays all that down to go and do what? To serve Elijah. Because there was something that happened. When that mantle was put upon him, there was something that happened in the spirit realm and inside of him, that he was willing to lay all of that aside to go and to care for this prophet of God. To lay everything aside and go and serve this man. Now, I want you to just kind of keep that in mind. Turn with me to 1 Samuel chapter 18. In 1 Samuel chapter 17, that's the story of David and Goliath. Okay, David slays Goliath. You say, what does that have to do with anything here? It's just foundation for the story. Everybody knows David and Goliath. I mean, we learn about David and Goliath in Sunday school. Okay, anybody that's been to Sunday school for very long, they've heard the story of David and Goliath. But look at verse, of chapter 18, starting at verse 1. Now, when he had finished speaking to Saul, in other words, he returns. Uh, he, he returns from the battle, and he comes back. Uh, and he basically has the head of Goliath with him. And he finished speaking to Saul. The soul of Jonathan was knit to the soul of David, and Jonathan loved him as his own soul. Now, there's a lot of people that would like to twist that into, into something sexual, but it was it had nothing to do with anything sexual. He just loved him. There was a brotherly love that came for Jonathan, for his brother, for, well, one natural brother, but for David, okay? Great love. But look what happens. Saul took him that day and would not let him go home to his father's house anymore. Then Jonathan and David made a covenant because he loved him as his own soul. He loved this man. There was something, there was a connection that was made between these two men that there was a great love to where they would be able to 
um, uh, they made this covenant. But look what happens. Verse 4, And Jonathan took off the robe, or the mantle, that was on him, and gave it to David, with his armor, even to his sword, to his bow, and his belt. He took these things off of himself, and he gave them to David. All right? Now, if you read chapter 17, and I'm sure you have, when David uh, talks to Saul about going out into battle and to defeat Goliath, Saul takes and gives him his armor, and he puts it, he says, I can't go in these, you know, I haven't tried them. They're too big for me anyway. I mean, Saul was a great big guy and all that. Well, Jonathan was probably a pretty big guy too, okay, uh, coming along after his father. But here he is. He takes off his armor. He takes his sword. He takes his belt or girdle. He takes that which holds everything together on him. He takes all that off, including his robe or his mantle, and gives it to David. Coincidence? Or is there something that God is saying to us in these two stories. I believe there's something God's really wanting us to hear and to know. All right? Now, I'm not going to, for sake of time, I, I'm not going to go through... Uh, let me put this over here. Thank you. I'm not going to go through all of this. Um, the belt, um, we, we can look at that as, as the mercies of God, okay? Uh, be girded with the mercies of God. The, the uh, sword, uh, I, you know what the sword is, Hebrews chapter 4 and verse 12, the sword is the sword of the Spirit. Uh, the Word of God is quicker and powerful than sword of, uh, a two-edged sword, piercing even to dividing of asunder. So you know about that. Let me put it in this term, okay? The sword is what God has given to you and me for close combat. Hand-to-hand -hand combat, okay? Mm -hmm. So when Jonathan takes off his sword, gives his sword to David, in essence, he's doing a couple of things. One of the things that he is doing is he is saying, I'm giving you the right to speak into my life. I'm giving you the right to speak into my life. Here is my sword, which is used for close-hand combat. I'm giving you the right to use it on me. But I also want you to understand that I will not harm you up close. I'll not harm you up close. I will not harm you. I'm giving you everything. I will not harm you, but I give you the right to speak into my life. Okay? Let's look at the bow for a minute, though. He also gave him his bow. Now, what is the bow? Is the bow for close combat? No. Go to John chapter 14. And I'll get back on that mantle here in just a few minutes because that's where I really want to go. But you, you've got to see a couple of these things real quick. John chapter 14. And I'll start reading at verse, um, I'll start at verse 27. Peace I leave with you. This is Jesus speaking. And uh, he says, Peace I will leave with you. I leave with you. My peace I give to you. Not as the world gives do I give to you. Let not your heart be troubled. Neither let it be afraid. How many of you know God doesn't want you to be fearful? He doesn't want you to have fear. doesn't want you to be afraid. He says, Let not your heart be troubled. Neither let it be afraid. You have heard me say to you, I'm going away and coming back to you. If you loved me, do you love him? Yes. Yeah. Yes. I hope so after singing some of those songs. <laughs> <laughs> if you loved me, you would rejoice because I said I'm going to the Father, for my Father is greater than I. And now I have told you before it comes that when it does come to pass, you may believe. Verse 30, I will no longer talk with you, talk much with you, for the ruler of this world is coming he has nothing in me. Right. Wait a minute. Did you notice what he said? He said the ruler of this world is coming. He didn't say the ruler of this world is here. He didn't say the ruler of this world is testing me and trying me right now. He didn't say I'm in the battle right now. He said the ruler of this world is coming. But there's nothing in me. 
the bow. The bow is that which is used for long range. The bow is that which you use for the enemy that is a long way off. And what I want you to just see here, and we could talk a little bit more about this, but what I want you to really see here is that when Jonathan gives to David his sword, he is saying to him, I will not harm you, but I give you the right to speak into my life. But he's also saying, I will not harm you from a distance. I will not speak against you. I will not harm you at a distance. I will not harm you close. I will never speak against you. I will always, my heart will always be open to you, that you can do whatever you want to me. My love is that great for you. All right? Now, the bow is that which is the long range. Jesus said this, the enemy is coming. He saw him coming. He saw the enemy before he got there. Amen? Does that say anything to you? How many times are we blindsided by tests and trials? How many times do we, you know, Maybe get up and have a great morning or something. And all of a sudden, the phone rings or this happens. That, and all of a sudden, oh, no. And we're blindsided. What I believe that God wants us to understand is that he is giving us, Jesus paid it all. Did he not? Amen. And he gave us all. Amen? Amen. So I believe that Jesus is wanting us to be able to see that the enemy is coming. We may be in a, in a, in a time of, of um, spring or, or summer where the things are really going well in, in our ministry, in our life or whatever. But uh, we can begin to see that the enemy is about to attack and we can begin to use the bow against him. Jesus has paid it all. He has given to you and to me everything that we have need of to defeat the enemy. And I believe that we can defeat the enemy before he ever gets to us. Now, let me say this. I'll balance myself by saying this. God doesn't always let us see everything, okay? I'll, I'll balance it by saying that. And I can give you scripture for that, but I don't want to take time to do that. But God, God doesn't always give us that uh, that eyesight. But there's times he does. There's times that we see things. There's times that we know things. There's times that people will give us a warning. People will say something to us and we should have our ears tuned to where, ah, yeah, uh, I, I don't want to go that way. If I go that way, I put myself in, in problem. Amen? Amen? And other things can happen. We begin to see and we can begin to Speak against the things of the Lord. And I'll come back to that in a few minutes. But what's this mantle? What's this mantle? When Elijah threw the mantle on Elisha, when Jonathan took his robe off, his mantle, and gave it to David, what was he in essence really doing? When Elisha took the mantle off, he was saying to Elijah, or Elijah took the mantle off, he was saying to Elisha, you can become the prophet like me. You begin to wear the identity of a prophet. This is my identity. This is who I am. I now place it on you. When Jonathan took the a mantle off the robe and gave it to David, that man, that robe was not just any old, it wasn't a bathrobe. Hello? Mm -hmm. It wasn't just an ordinary coat. He was the prince. Hello? He was the prince. That robe identified him as the prince of Israel. That robe identified him as the next king of Israel. That robe identified him as the son of Saul in line to become the next king. <coughs> Amen. And he took that robe and he put it on David, he gave it to David, and David then, that in in fact, I looked at it this way. I began to realize that in reality, he's giving David confirmation of the prophetic word that Samuel had given to him back in 1 Samuel 16. But the word that had come to him a number of years before. Amen. But here is some confirmation the robe. And from that point on, when David would wear that robe, everyone would look at if, if they never knew him, if they had never seen him, never knew him before, as soon as he walked into their midst, they would know instantly who he was. He 
was in line for the throne. He was the man of God that was going to begin to rule and reign over Israel. It was his identity. It was who he was. Now let me ask you this. What difference does that make to you and me? The difference is this. One day Jesus went to the cross. And when he went to the cross, they took off all of his robe. They took off his clothes. He hung on that cross naked, folks. He was not covered at all. He was naked. He took off everything. They took it off of him. But he had everything was taken off of him. For what purpose? For you and for me. And the robe of the Lord was placed. They gambled for it because they didn't want to divide it amongst themselves. So they gambled for it, which says this one thing to me. It was whole. Hello. And whoever it was that won it <laughs> had the whole robe. Oh, are you hearing anything? The Lord Jesus, he gave his mantle. He gave his robe for you and for me. It's a robe that identifies you as to who you are, who you and I really are, who we are. We are not just some people that just happen to be walking down the street and just happen to uh, uh, have, uh, have a cross around our neck or, or something like that or just say that I'm a Christian. There is something about us, just like when Elijah threw that mantle on Elisha, something happened in his spirit. Something happened in him that he was willing to lay aside everything to become a servant to this man until he came to the place where he and Elijah are walking along the road and they're trying to, uh, Elijah's going to be taken up to be with the Lord. And he says, what do you want? In fact, before that, three different times, people said, don't you know your master's going to be taken from your head today? You can stay here. You can stay here. You can be the prophet of Bethel. You can be the prophet of this. You can be the prophet of that. And he says, no, no. No, no. Well, what do you want? I want a double portion. I want a double portion of what he had. I'm not interested in just becoming known as a prophet. I'm not interested in just becoming known as one who Elijah put his robe upon and his hand upon and put me into, into a ministry. I'm not interested in just, I want a double portion. Everything he was, everything he did, I want to be able to, I want twice. The relationship he had with God, I want twice. Hello? Well, yeah, boy, that's what happened, right? Uh -huh. Let's get back to Jesus and you and me. Greater works than these show you what? How? Because he's got a mantle that he's put upon you and me. He's got something that is put there, and it is a mantle of, of who he is. He is the king of kings. He's the Lord of lords. He is the, the creator of all things. He is the one that spoke, and the, and the uh, uh, storm subsided. He's the one that spoke, and, and when the disciples uh, followed what he said and threw the nets on the other side, it was full of fish. He's the one that would speak to the tree, and it cursed Hello, long range bow, sword, okay, whatever. He's the one, and he's put a mantle. He's put something there for you and for me. In other words, brothers and sisters, we're not just human beings walking around the face of this earth, biding our time and hoping God can use us for a little bit of ministry here and there. You and I, when you know Jesus Christ as your personal Savior, you're filled with the Spirit, He puts a mantle upon you, and you have a gift of God, and you have something of the essence of who He was and who He is, and when you walk down the street or you drive down the road, there's, there should be something about you that people look and say, that's a Christian. 
That's a Christian. I can trust. Have you ever been in a Walmart or grocery store or someplace and uh, Myers, I guess, and, and you're walking around and you're just minding your own business and doing what you want to do, you know, uh, uh, checking some fruit or whatever, and all of a sudden a total stranger comes walking up to you and starts talking to you and starts opening up? Did you ever walk into a situation, you meet someone for the very first time, and all of a sudden they're wanting to turn everything over? I mean, they're just opening up everything. Why? Because they recognize the mantle. They recognize something inside of you that they either didn't have or something that they wanted, something that they needed. They recognize there was a mantle upon you that would bring an answer to their problems. Wow. I, I, I mean, I hope, I'm trying to get a hold of it. I, I'm trying to really get a hold of this thing. That, that, that there's something more in us than what we have imagined. Amen. Amen. Go to Revelation chapter 2. Revelation chapter 2 and verse 17. He who has an ear... You have an ear? Let him hear what the Spirit says to the churches. To him who overcomes, now for you to overcome, you have to have something to overcome. Okay? But to him who overcomes, I will give some of the hidden manna to eat. What's hidden manna? Um, I, I'll give you an hour's worth of message right here in, in two sentences, one or two sentences, all right? The hidden manna is that manna that they, that Moses had them take manna, put it in a golden pot, and set it inside the Ark of the Covenant, and it never stank, it never got old, it never bred worms or nothing. It was hidden. He says, I will give you the hidden manna. And the second sentence is this. The hidden manna is the hidden word of God. All right? I'll give you the hidden manna, manna to eat, and I will give him a what? A white stone, and on the stone... A what? A new, name. a new name. Written, which no one knows except him who receives it. No one knows the name but you who receive it. In other words, when you receive the mantle of the Lord, there is something, you, you get a new nature. You get a new name, a new nature. There's something about you and about that mantle. There's something about when, uh, see, it's not just, it's not just, Lord, forgive me, put the blood of, uh, on my heart. No, it's more than that. There is the mantle of God that he begins to place upon you and me so that we can begin to do the works of the Father. We can begin to do those things that he has called us to do and to be. I believe with all my heart, everyone, that every Christian, has a gift of calling, Amen. has something from God yes. that they are to fulfill. I believe that. Mm -hmm. And he says, I give you a new name. I give you a, new, a, a stone, a white stone, on the stone, a new name written, which no one knows except you when you receive it. When David got that robe, Elisha got that robe, they understood what was happening. They understood. Elisha understood. I am to become a prophet of God. I have been called to be a prophet of God. When David got that robe from Jonathan, he is saying, I, there's confirmation. I am to be the next king. And he puts on that robe and he begins to walk around. His whole demeanor changes. No longer is this young man a shepherd boy out by himself, out taking care of a few sheep according to his brothers. But he is now the next in line for the throne. He is now the man that God has chosen to uh, fulfill the purpose of God for Israel, to make a difference in the life of others. When you and I have received the mantle of the Lord, and when you give your life to the Lord, that is exactly what you get. You get his mantle. There's a mantle that you receive to fulfill something in God. Go to John or to Revelation chapter, I think it's 19, 20, uh, 21. 21. 
I just saw this just recently, and it just speaks to my heart. Matthew, uh, Revelation chapter 21 and verse 6 and 7. And he said to me, it is done. I am the Alpha and the Omega, the beginning and the end. You sang a song a little while ago. I, I, I'd never heard that song before, but uh, one of the lines said, you are who you say you are. Okay? I am the Alpha and the Omega. I am the beginning and the end. I will give of the fountain of the water of life freely to him who thirsts. If you're thirsty, I'll give you the fountain of life. It reminds me of John chapter 4, when Jesus is at the well of Samaria. But look at verse 7. He who overcomes shall inherit a couple things. Mm -hmm. Oh. Oh. All. Oh. Now wait a minute. How do you inherit all things? Well, you have to overcome, first of all. But how do you inherit all things? It's because he puts his mantle on you. And you begin to move. Do you, you realize that when David received that mantle, well, Elisha, Elisha too. I mean, Elisha received that mantle. He had to leave home. He left father, mother. He left the land. He left the finance. He left, he left the, the, um, um, the, the secure future. He left all of that to obey what? Because a crazy man threw a mantle on him. Okay? I mean, that's what he could look at and say, oh, just, who's this crazy guy? To, you know, forget it. No, he left all of that because he recognized, I've been called. I am now a prophet of God. I'll become. And he went and served Elijah, Elijah to become what he recognized as he was plowing with those oxen. And David, David didn't have it easy either. He runs from Saul. Saul tries to kill him a couple of times. He has to dodge the javelin that is thrown at him. He goes into battle time after time after time. I mean, he didn't have it easy. And sometimes, brothers and sisters, we don't have it easy either. But you know what? There's a mantle upon you. There's a mantle and there's some things that God has given to you. There's a sword of the spirit that you can use in your own spirit, in your own heart, to cut the soul from the spirit, to divide the things that are wrong, to divide the things that are right and wrong in your heart and life. And then there's that bow that is used to, you begin to see also, you have the eyes of the eagle to see the enemy coming. And you can begin to do those things that will thwart what he is doing. You begin to uh, prepare yourself and you begin to work and perhaps even do things in such a way that you avoid it. Amen? You Amen. avoid the problem altogether. I, I believe that. I give you an example of it, but I, I want to go on. Revelation 22. Remember Revelation 21. I will give of the fountain of the water of life freely to him who thirsts. I will be his God, and he shall be my son. That's the mantle. He shall be my son. Chapter 22 and verse... Uh, I'll just go to verse 17. And the Spirit, Spirit and the Bride, the Spirit is the Holy Spirit, the Bride is who? Okay, it's the church. Say, come. And let him who hears, so if you hear, you are also to say, come. And let him who thirsts, come. Whoever desires, let him take the water of life freely. He has placed there for you and me. He's calling us to grow up, to become mature, but he is not just saying, oh, come on, grow up, like we do to our kids once in a while, you know. Um, being principal of the school, I say that to the kids every now and then, you know, especially the teenagers. I'll look at, they'll do something stupid, and I'll just, come on, grow up, will you? You know, I mean, you got, am I the only one who's ever done that? <laughs> That's what I thought. Okay. And, and we do that, you know. And Jesus isn't just saying, oh, come on, grow up. He's saying here, 
I want to change everything about you. I want to cause you to become my son, mm -hmm. not just my little boy, my mm -hmm. son. Not just someone, not just an adopted son that's, a, that's a, a, a there in the household, but I want you to become my son. You will be recognized as you belong to me. From the point, from the time that David put on that robe, he was recognized no longer as a shepherd boy. He was recognized as a prince. No longer as just the eighth son of Jacob. He's now a prince. He has now been brought in, and he is the prince of Judah. He is the one that's in, in line for the throne. Amen. Brothers and sisters, God wants to so clothe you with himself that, that people look upon you, and they don't see just you and me. What they see is the presence of God in our life. What they see is the glory of God coming from us. What they see is the reality of Christ coming out of our heart and out of our life. Amen. Amen. I'm not going to turn to it, but in the book of Judges, there's an interesting story. <clears throat> in chapter 6 and chapter 7 of Judges, uh, Gideon, Gideon is called, receives his call from God, and you guys know the story, and well, maybe I better turn to it. I, wanna, I, I do want to get this part here right. Verse 12, And the angel of the Lord appeared to him, to Gideon, and said to him, The Lord is with you, you mighty man of valor. Now he's hiding. He's hiding. He's threshing wheat. Just read up a couple of verses before that. And you see that he's hiding. He's threshing his wheat, I believe it was. Yeah, verse 11. Threshing wheat in the winepress in order to hide it from the Midianites. Okay. The angel of the Lord appears to him. And says, the Lord is with you, you mighty man of valor. Now, how would you feel if an angel of the Lord appeared to you? And you don't know it's the angel of the Lord, but it's an angel of the Lord. He appears to you and he says, the Lord is with you, you mighty man of valor. And you're hiding. <laughs> I mean, in Acts chapter 2, they were hiding. Okay? They were hiding in the upper room. They had the doors locked. All right? They were hiding. And here he is. He's hiding and, and uh, just trying to eat out a little bit of sustenance for his family he doesn't want the Midianites to know that he's got this the, the this crop they don't want him to know that so he's hiding it okay and uh, the angel says the Lord is with you you mighty man of valor and look at Gideon's response Gideon said to him oh my Lord if the Lord is with us have you ever said that if if the Lord is really with us why then has all this happened to us why am I going through this trouble? Why am I going through these problems? Why am I going through this situation? And where are all his, and this is where I want you to look, where are all his miracles which our fathers told us about saying, did not the Lord bring us up from Egypt? Notice what he's doing. He's referring, he's talking to the angel and he's referring back to all the testimonies. He's referring back to all of the things, the miracles that had happened, all the things that his fathers and his father, his grandfather, his great grand all these men of God had said to him. He's referring to all of them. But now the Lord has forsaken us and delivered us into the hands of the Midianites. Then the Lord, and it's interesting here, it's referred to as the Lord instead of the angel. But anyway, the Lord turned to him and said, Go in this might of yours. I got a question for you. It goes on to say, and you shall save Israel from the hand of the Midianites. Have I not sent you? What might was the angel or the Lord telling him to go in? Was it the might of you mighty man of valor? Or was it the might that was resident within him because he's recognizing all of the testimonies and all of the great miracles and all of the things that God had done in the past. And there's a cry in his heart, Lord, if you did, you did these things. Our fathers have told us about them. There's been testimony and testimony. And the word testimony, the base, base part of the word testimony, the Hebrew means do it again. Mm 
So when you give a testimony, you're saying, Lord, do it again. You did this, do it again. So he's re really referring back to that angel, and he's saying, all these things that the, that the Lord did for us, do it again. Why aren't you doing them now? I, I kind of think that maybe that's the might that the Lord's referring to when he says, go in this might. Go in the understanding of the miracles and of the deliverance that God has done in the past, and you will see it again. But how many times, brothers and sisters, do we hear testimonies or do we hear the word of the Lord? We hear somebody saying something, and then we turn around and, oh, that was great, that was nice. And then we find ourselves in a similar situation and we say, oh, me, what am I going to do? Go in this might. The might of having the mantle. Now, Oh, well, i got to read one more verse of Scripture here. Verse 34. But the Spirit of the Lord came upon Gideon. And just stop right there. The Spirit of the Lord came upon Gideon. The real understanding of that verse is this. And the Lord clothed himself with Gideon. The Lord clothed himself with Gideon. Mantle. The Lord clothed him. A couple of you are going to get this in a minute. The Lord has put a mantle upon you. And in reality, what that mantle is, is he's clothing himself with you. He is clothing himself. I should have brought my coat up here. Give me my coat around. And the Lord clothed himself. The Lord threw the mantle upon him so that from that day on, he's no longer looked upon as being a shepherd boy. He's no longer looked upon as being one of the, uh, uh, the son of, his, of, of Saphat. He is now the prophet. He's now the man that is preparing to become the prophet in the place of Elijah. Elijah. Amen. And he's looked upon. He's seen. Every time they see him, they see the mantle. Every time they see you and me, they should be seeing the Christ. They should be seeing because God is clothing He's so changing your character and your nature and mine that he begins... He is seeing, he's doing the work, but he's doing it through you and through me. He's clothing himself. Just clothing himself. Putting it on. So that everybody sees the mantle. They see the coat. Amen. Anybody hearing what I'm saying? Yes. Now, go back to Revelation 21 and 22. The Spirit and the Bride say, come. If you're thirsty, come. Come what? And drink of the water of life. Not just drink of the water that you'll thirst again. John chapter 4. Give me something to drink. What, do you have something to draw with? He said, the well was deeper. Father's brought the, what, what? He says, if you knew who it was that was speaking to you, you would ask for the water of life that I have. I would give you the water that once you drink of it, you never thirst anymore. But instead, you are able to turn around and say, come, come, ye who are thirsty, come. And why? How can you say that? Because you've now got a mantle. You've now got that mantle on you that says, I drank of the water of life. I now have a mantle that I can now give you water of life. I can now give to you out of your innermost belly, your being, shall flow rivers of living water. Why? Because you picked up the mantle of Jesus. You picked up the coat, the clothes, the clothing, 
the sword of the spirit, the, the bow. You've picked up the things that God has prepared for you to use in life. Hallelujah. Go to Psalms chapter 2. The Lord just gave me this verse of scripture while we were singing. I'm not sure I even got it written down. Nope. Psalms chapter 2, verse 1. Why do the nations rage and the people plot a vain thing? That can happen in the church too, by the way. Uh, the kings of the earth set themselves and the rulers take counsel together against the Lord and against who? His anointed. Against those that the mantle has been placed upon, the anointed, saying, let us break their bonds in pieces and cast away their cords from us. He who sits in the heavens shall laugh. The Lord shall hold them in derision. Then he shall speak to them in his wrath and distress them in his deep pleasure. Yet I have set my king on my holy hill, uh, holy hill of Zion. Verse 7. I will declare the decree. I will declare the decree. The Lord has said to me, you are my son today. I have begotten you. And I know that's speaking specifically of the Lord. But can I say to you, it's what he wants to say to each one of us. Today, I have begotten you. Ask of me. And I will give you the nations for your inheritance and the ends of the earth for your possession. I'm beginning to believe more today than ever before that if we really knew who we were or who we are in Christ, we would be changing this world. We would be making a difference in the lives of others around us in some way, shape, or form. Of course, I understand it starts here with us first. I understand that. Sword. Okay. See, I don't want to use the sword against you, but I'll definitely want to use it for me. Jonathan gave it to David saying, you have every right to use it on me, but I'll not harm you. You have every right to speak into my life. You have every right to help me to know and to understand what is right and what is wrong. You have the right to speak into my life. I kind of wonder what would happen if every member of the church would go to their pastor with that idea. And the pastor would get before God for the people in such a way that he would have the words of life that would speak into their spirit and into their heart to help them to really know their calling and prepare them to walk in that calling. I, and it takes more than the pastors. Okay? There's the apostle, prophet, evangelist, pastor, teacher, there's administrators, there's intercessors, there's all of the gifts. But what would happen? What would happen in a church? Let alone what would happen in the world. What would happen in just a church where the people went to the pastor and when he began to preach something that they didn't like? I, I'm smiling. I'm glad a couple of you are too. <laughs> But I wish all of you would. What would happen if he starts preaching something that starts making them a little uncomfortable? Instead of them getting up and walking out. Instead of them leaving the, the, and the oh, that pastor. Rah, rah, rah. No, instead of doing that, they just, yes, Lord, I need to hear that, Lord. What would happen to that church? What would happen to that community? What would happen to the world? Glory. 
we would do that. If we really recognized who we were in God, the mantle of Christ that is on us, the call of God that we have, and begin to declare that. What did he say, verse 7? I will declare the decree. And we begin to declare, I am a child of God. I am growing up in Christ. I am fulfilling the call of God in my life. I am searching for, looking for, and I am planning on, and I'm doing everything I can to prepare myself for the call of God on my life. And I'm entering in, and we begin to declare the decree. How, what would happen in the church if we, each member, began to really do that? I don't think this world, well, in fact, actually what happened is, is, um, uh, let us break their bonds in pieces and cast their cords away from us. <sighs> but what did verse 6 say? And he shall speak to them in his wrath and distress upon them. God began to move. Why? Because we began to stand up in who we really were. Isn't it interesting, brothers and sisters? That Jesus takes the disciples, in fact, in, I think it's in uh, Luke 10, he sends out 70 disciples, 70 uh, people, and they come back rejoicing that, that uh, demons are, are bound by, you know, they, they, they cast out demons and healed sick and all this, and yet Jesus begins to pull them aside and he begins to work with them even more. And then on the day when Jesus dies, on that day, and is resurrected, they're in a room, locked doors, terrified, afraid that they're going to come and get them too. <clears throat> Until all of a sudden, <clears throat> when the day of Pentecost was fully come, a mantle began to fall. A mantle began to hit, and they began to be filled with the Spirit, and they went out with boldness. And only a chapter or two later, the apostles are in prison, and the angel of the Lord comes and gets them out, opens a door and sends them out, says with this word, go back into the temple and preach in the name of the Lord. And they go back into the temple, and when the, when the guards come to get them, the prison doors are open. They're not there. Where are they? Well, they're out there boldly, boldly declaring. Oh, what happened to them? What happened to these men who were terrified? What happened to these men who went and saw people healed, saw people delivered, and then they, then they began to forget about those things, and they locked themselves in the door, locked themselves in the room for fear. And then all of a sudden, they realized who they were. All of a sudden, something happened. They received a mantle, if you please. They received something from God that so changed their lives, so revitalized them. They were no longer afraid of death, no longer afraid of the religious leaders, no longer afraid of Rome and their swords, no longer afraid to go and to even be crucified themselves. Something happened in their spirit and in their life that drastically changed their identity, who they knew they were. Elisha was changed. David was changed. The disciples were changed. And we sit in the United States one of these days, today's that day. Today is the day to rise up in who we really are. Today is the day to recognize the mantle of God that's on you. The call of God, the anointing of God, the presence of God.
that's in your life and begin to declare the decree as to who he is and to who you belong to. Amen? Amen. Amen. Let's stand. Amen. You got something? And the Lord spoke unto the lady at the well and said, If you knew the gift of God and who it is that speaketh unto you, you would ask him for this living water. And I would say unto you, my people this night, many know the gift of God. Many know the salvation at the cross of Calvary. But many still do not know the one who it is that speaketh unto them. I would say, look into the water of my word and see my face. Mm -hmm. I would say, look into the water of my word and see your face. Mm -hmm. I would say, look into the water of my word that you may have strength to run the race. I would say, look into the water of my word that you might take your rightful place. And in that day, you will then realize my amazing grace. Amen. 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 Father, we just come to you right now. First of all, I want to thank you for what you did for us, Jesus. I want to thank you that you laid down your mantle, you laid down your life that we could have life. You laid down everything that you were Jesus, the, the word declares no man could take your life, but you freely gave it. You gave it for the joy of what you saw would be coming, a people that know you, a people that would know their God and do exploits, a people that would walk in the same spirit and the same anointing that you walked in. Lord, you even spoke and said a, a grain of wheat abides by itself. But if it's planted, it brings forth a harvest. Lord, you allowed yourself to be planted into our hearts and our lives. Open up our spirits and our minds to hear your word and to understand that you want to truly fill us with yourself. You want to clothe yourself with us and to walk on this earth fulfilling the very the very purposes of God in Jesus' name. And Lord, I thank you for it. And right now, mighty God, I just I just pray. Lord, you, you gave me the scripture about declaring a thing and, and you, you, you spoke to my heart about using the bow and using the sword of the Spirit. Father, we skipped over some other, but Lord, those two items in particular you, you gave to me to, to share with the folks here tonight because you want us to use them tonight. You want us to begin to recognize the struggles that we're in or the struggles that we recognize are coming, the potential of the problems that, Lord, we don't have the finances to pay this bill that's coming up or we don't have whatever it might be, Lord. Whatever it might be. And you have given to us that ability tonight to speak to it and to declare to it, Lord, and to... Change the direction of our life and to change the direction of what the enemy would like to do in our life. Father, we just ask you to forgive us for not really comprehending what you have done and what you have given to us. And Lord, help us to overcome the problems in our life and to overcome those situations that are coming our way. In Jesus' name, amen. amen. And I believe that God wants, I know, I think the last time I was here, I prophesied over probably most of you, 
But I, I, just, I just sense that God wants you to begin to declare, you to look into your situations and the circumstances with your children, with your home, with your finances, with that, whatever it might be, and you begin to declare, taking the mantle of God that he's placed upon you and begin to declare what God says about it. And begin to speak into that situation, into that circumstance. Take the word of God and begin to apply it into the circumstance. Amen? Amen. If it's finances, you begin to follow the pattern for finances in there. And you begin to speak to those bills. I, I, I Just real quick, uh, and I do mean, I'll try to make it real short. There was a time in our life, <coughs> six of us at home, and... Um, uh, Thankfully, my youngest was a baby, and we we're at home, and we we're living on about ten dollars a week for food. Now, granted, ten dollars went a lot further than it does today. But that's what we we're living on. My kids got all anemic, sick. Doctor chewed my wife out; they were so sick because they didn't have the right nutrition. And to cut the story short, God began to show me how to handle my finances. The amount of money came in never changed. But my bills got paid and my family got fed. Everything got taken care of because I began to follow the principles of God in my life. What is, that's just one situation. What are some of the other? What is a situation in your life? What's a situation with your children? What's a situation at home? What's a, are your, is your family following God? Are they walking in Christ or are they running? It's time to begin to speak, to declare the word of the Lord. I have declared. I've given my children when they were babies. I dedicated to the Lord and I began to run. Remind the Lord of that. Today, every one of them are serving the Lord in some capacity. I believe it's because we began to declare the word of the Lord over their life. Remind the Lord what he had said about them. I've got the prophecies, and every now and then, prophecies to my kids, the prophecies to us, and every now and then I just get them out and read them and remind the Lord and myself of what God has said. And it's time. As we was coming down here, I felt like God spoke to me and said, it's time for you to declare the word of the Lord into your situation. Because I might declare it, I might prophesy, but when you declare it, something begins to happen. When you declare it, the word of God. When you declare the prophecies, when you declare what God has spoken to your heart, something happens in the spirit realm. You send out those arrows. You send out that barrage of arrows and you begin to scatter the enemy. You begin to walk in the freedom of Christ. Amen? Amen. So Father, I just ask, Lord, it just reminded me in the book of Acts, after, after the disciples were beaten for speaking your word, they went back to the assembly and they began to pray and they said, Lord, give us more boldness. I'm praying right now, Lord, you give each one of us boldness, more boldness to declare the word of God into our lives, in the lives of our family, the lives of situations that we are facing. And I thank you for it in Jesus' name. Amen. 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 Anybody have anything they need special prayer for? Or they just plain need to stand and declare something? I want you. Let's stand. I'm, I'm done preaching.